Ooh. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Oh, I am Michael Davis, and welcome to Bone to Pick Biz, our biannual series within Bone to Pick, where I interview a super successful business person who also has a very strong connection to music and to brass in particular. And this will hopefully give us uh, a really healthy and, 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 in, and innovative way to look at business from uh, a musician's perspective. And we started off uh, our first interview with Ben Valdanza, the CEO of Spirit Airlines. And today uh, we are with one of my favorite people I've uh, had the pleasure of knowing throughout my entire life, uh, Mr. Dan Gordon. He is a obviously a super successful businessman. He is the founder and creator of Gordon Beer's Brewery here in San Jose, where we are today. He's also an exceptionally talented bass trombone player. Uh, Dan and I had the pleasure of uh, playing together in the California Youth Symphony many years ago when we were in high school. He went on to uh, obtain degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as the Technical University of Munich, which is like a brewing degree, but an engineering degree, and Dan will talk a lot more about that. Uh, he started the Gordon Biersch Brewery uh, restaurant in Palo Alto in 1988. He opened uh, the, the uh, brewery and bottling facility here in San Jose in 1997. Uh, Gordon Beer's beers have gone on to uh, win a myriad of, uh, of awards for their, for their great beers. Um, Dan is also the creator of the uh, famous Gordon Beer's garlic fries, which you can uh, have at any airport in the Bay Area, at all the Gordon Beer's restaurants and uh, all the uh, sports arenas and stadiums in the area. So they really have a huge following. He teaches at Stanford University. He has lectured at University of California, Berkeley, University of San Francisco, UCLA. And I think most importantly, uh, he played on the Absolute Trombone 2 CD on the 76 Trombone track. It was great to have him come out to New York and play. Dan, thanks so much for being here today and uh, for, for having us at uh, your amazing facility. Well, Mike, thanks. It's all about product placement, as you yes. know. So this is just one more opportunity to push, push my stuff. <laughs> Yeah, let's jump in and... Uh, no, really, Mike. Let's just talk. <laughs> oh, I'm let's sorry. Talk, yeah. 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 Is, uh, it, <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. Let's, I'm sorry about let's that. Talk, let's talk about uh, you growing up in the Bay Area. You went to Homestead High School. As we mentioned, we, uh, you played in the California Youth Symphony. Talk about the trombone a little bit and then going to University of California, Berkeley, and then maybe, maybe take us through, up through your, your time in Munich. A lot of sound effects here, huh? This Love is it. authentic. Mike wanted to have the real thing going on here at the brewery. And I've got everything crashing around us. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, we met in the good old days playing uh, playing trombone, and you know, I, I thought you were your dad when you walked in because you're Mike, Mike Davis, Joe Davis' son, and I, I was stupefied, you know, honored to be in the same section with you, and uh, that's about it. it. Everything from there went uh, perfect. <laughs> you set the tone. <laughs> but I, I think what I got was you know the discipline of music, and also as an athlete in college. Those two things set, set me in, in place for success in uh, the real life, real world. And what, how, was, how was the experience at uh, California Berkeley? What was, that, what was your focus when you were there? My focus was getting enough sleep um, because <laughs> I was on the crew team and we had to get up early for practice. So I, at that point, I, I really transferred. I wanted to do everything. And academics, of course, I wanted to study abroad. What happened was at Cal, I, was, uh, I got the rowing part of my life, discipline from that. Um, then the practice that I had you know, working on trauma and work uh, growing up, those two things kind of set me in a, in a, you know, I'd say a fairly competitive mode to, mm. to succeed. Cal is a very um, intense school where you're on your own, so, uh, so you, you really don't have a lot of support, and that's one of the things you need when you start up a company. So those are skill sets that transfer over and a mentality set that transfers over. I was the exchange student my junior year when I went to uh, Berkeley, was in Göttingen in northern Germany thumbing through a catalog of all the different fields of study and saw brewing engineering and beverage technology and I said, bingo, this is what I was put on earth to do. The building mm -hmm. we're in here right now is uh, the former Continental Can Factory and it used to manufacture cans for the fruit canning industry. And I happened to work at the canneries growing up as a summer job uh, during college. Oh, wow. And I love manufacturing and I put the two together, the beer thing, you know, obviously, as you can tell, we're not like drinkers. Uh, so <laughs> being able to have a, you know, a, an item or a product that it's self, very self-fulfilling. Uh, it's a good feeling to actually make something tangible. Sure. And uh, being able to study that in Germany, I went back, did the five-year brewing engineering program, came back, wrote the business plan for Gordon Beersch. So I was very focused and driven and knew exactly the path I wanted to take. Wow, that's awesome. So you had that one moment that just kind of like everything became clear to you and like set you on your path. And yep. Awesome. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about once you got out of uh, the school in Munich and you, you uh, interned at the Spaten Brewery? I actually did that during my uh, education. So okay. the German university system is a little different than the American one. Uh, engineering uh, grad students have to already have hands-on experience. So that's when I worked at Anheuser-Busch first, right after Berkeley, to get six months of training there. And then I went, uh, during my uh, graduate program, I got uh, an internship at Spaten, and then I also worked at uh, manufacturing equipment um, company where I learned how to weld, do stainless steel welding. Because oh, wow. if you look around the brewery, everything's stainless. Yeah. So I, I wanted to have, and then I worked for Lovenbrow Consulting to do technical translation. So I got every aspect. I, I really feel that it's important to have hands-on experience whenever you're going to pursue a career. You don't mm -hmm. want to learn on the job. You want to try to learn ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Words of wisdom. Yeah, and indeed. And good advice for, I think, musicians as well. I mean, we get so kind of focused in one aspect of what we do, you know, but, well, but it's, it's important to know all, everything about music. Well, and, the, the funniest thing is Rory Snyder, who you know well, was our, course. my mentor, music uh, teacher in high school. And we did have an incredible music education at Homestead High School. That was one of the greatest things uh, going for us. And then we had the honor jazz things that we played together uh, outside of school. But he, uh, he told me when I was 15 to never turn down a gig. Mm. Um, I, I didn't know when I could stop doing that, so I was like 35 years old and still <laughs> taking like church, evangelical church gigs right. where they were faith healing and st stuff like that. Right. But um, it was one of those things. Uh, you know, Dave Eshelman, my, my instructor, uh, private instructor said, you know, we're gonna spend 20 minutes on classical, 20 minutes on fundamentals, and 20 minutes on jazz. Every, every lesson I had, it was always, always balanced diet. And that, that carries through, you gotta be able to do it all. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've created this, you know, it's a huge enterprise now, but you obviously came from that, like, I'm gonna create my own place. Uh, but you interned with Anheuser-Busch for a bit, I believe, and what was that like, and what did you take away from working in that super huge corporate environment? Uh, well, the first thing was fundamental cleanliness. A brewery has to be sterile, and Anheuser-Busch does that better than anybody else. I mean, they okay. that thing place where you could eat off the floor, and that's the mentality I took when I was working, the skill sets I could take uh, from, from that experience. And also it was an interesting uh, element being uh, part of a Teamster union. That, mm. was, that was definitely educational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you learn how to say what the fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the, those, were, those were two takeaways. Um, you know, the brewing skills, uh, I learned more in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, working at Spaten and the beers that I make are authentic German style beers. Right. That's really what I'm trying to emulate. But I will also learn that if Anheuser-Busch wanted to do the exact same style of beers that we produce, they certainly could do it. It's just they're not interested because they can't sell as much of it. Sure, sure. So take us now, now you're, you, you're through your internships and everything, and now you've decided to start Gordon Beersh, uh, the, the restaurant in, and brew pub yeah. in, in uh, Palo Alto was the first enterprise. And what, what was that like getting that role? Well, that was you know stressful. I was still in grad school. I wrote the business plan when I was in my third year of grad school. I uh, bought some brewing machinery while I was over there too. So I was already set in my mind that I was committed 100% to doing this project. And you have to have that. Wrote, wrote the business plan. I was a foodie growing up. I always cooked from the time I was 14. I'd been catering and, and loved that element of it. And I met Dean Beersh. We, he's the front of the house uh, and interior design portion of the company. I was the back of the house, food and the beer. And we had a very complimentary set of skills. And mm -hmm. That was one of the things that really put us on a, on a track towards success is that we had excellent complementary skill sets. So. I think that's one of the, the things that I learned. You don't want to have two generalists starting up a, build, a business. Mm -hmm. You have to have guys that know what they're doing in, in their fields, uh, specifically in their fields of expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we won. You know, really, we had a line out the door the first time we opened in Palo Alto. It was an old uh, movie theater that we converted over, 5,000 square foot, small local movie theater, and uh, set ourselves on the track. We went five for five with our first op you know, brewery restaurant openings. Yeah. And that's unusual. Uh, restaurant industry is one that you have generally a 90% failure rate, not a 90% success rate. Right. So that uh, that worked out by having that hands-on experience, the skill sets required, we were able to, to be successful. Yeah. It's it. This is kind of just a side thought that I had, but it is amazing to me when I think of the locations you guys picked. I mean, your downtown San Jose places. Yeah. It felt like it revived downtown San Jose and your San Francisco place under uh, the Bay Bridge there is stunning. Well, yeah, the San Francisco location. I wish it wasn't Mozilla's headquarters now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Firefox. Don't use Firefox, people. <laughs> anyway, that, you know, the, they were home run spot locations for sure. Main, the, we call it the corner of Maine and Maine. A locations. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, we are in the 114,000 square foot uh, brewing and bottling facility here. Uh, it, to create this, I can't even imagine what uh, the, the financial uh, base that's required and, and, and yeah. what, what you've done here. I can't either. I just. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition to the amazing Gordon Beerish brand itself, yeah. you do a lot of, uh, what do you call it, house House well, brewing? we do private label contracts. Private brewing, label, yeah. But, and with, with but our, our focal point really is, I mean, we have a large brewery and we want to keep this going 24-7. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like having a music studio. You don't want to have any empty time. Right. You know, that, it's once you've got the coastal real estate, you want to rent it out. Is there, I know you've touched on it a, a bit, but is there a, a general business philosophy that you adhere to yeah. um, in terms of building a brand of this stature? Uh, it's uncompromised. Quality. I mean, you, we source our raw materials from around the world we, to get the very, very best. And then we handle it properly. Um, we refrigerate door to door. We do six weeks of aging and lagering on the beers. They're all naturally carbonated, and no one else in this country can make those claims. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's no sense of ever considering compromise, mm -hmm. whether it's our beer or anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Would you say, like, how about your, your marketing? Uh outlook on things. Would that be secondary to the, the product itself? I yeah, guess I mean, it, it has if, if you can already play well, you know, just just getting people to listen to you is, that, is the next trick, right? Right, right, right. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about in clinics and master classes that I give, and, and I'm talking to music students who are facing this, you know, incredible uphill battle nowadays to become a musician, um, is you have to have, a, I, I call it act as if it's impossible to fail. And you have to have a belief that because you're going to face some times that are going to be extremely difficult. You're going to hear the word no a million times. And I know the last time that uh, my girlfriend Amy and I came out a couple years ago and you gave us a nice tour and we had such a great time. But you showed us the, uh, the tanks that we're seeing in the background here. And they, you described it as $250,000 per tank to install plus the tank. And then you have how many of those tanks? 20 of them. And if I'm not, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I remember you saying, I remember Amy asking you saying, uh, how, how much of your business that you currently have did you have in place when you got those tanks? And you said it was about 25% of your business, I think. Yeah, we were planning on the upside. And we actually, I, I engineered for, I'd be, let me just rewind on this. I had been in so many breweries when I was in Germany. All my classmates had breweries in their families. And I saw how they had expanded over hundreds of years. And they didn't plan for it from that get-go. So I put it in with mod infrastructure to be able to accept modular expansion. Mm. So there was always the ability to add on tankage, and we've mm. already done it twice. But even at the, when we first opened up, the, the demand, you're going to build it up over time. Mm -hmm. Well, so having the vision to see where it could go, but then to actually be able to pull the trigger and say, I'm going I'm to go ahead and do this. You obviously had that belief that this is going to happen. Oh, and, yeah. And, and well, we wouldn't be in business because we, we wouldn't have been able to afford to exist if we were just operating at that initial throughput. Right. So, so expansion was in your plans from, from the get-go? Yeah. The well, when we built our first brewery restaurant in Palo Alto, I expected to do five. You are still active as a trombonist and yep. playing a ton. Um, you, you obviously have an intimate knowledge of the music business. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about your, your thoughts and ideas about being a musician and, and the same kind of parallel thoughts that in running this multi-million dollar corporation. Like what, what, what mindset do you share in terms of being a musician? Uh, for me, first of all, I need music just to be a, a normal human being, and mm -hmm. it, it rounds me out, and if I didn't have it, I'd go bonkers. I'd, I'd implode, because the stress factor of, of the brewing operation, even though beer brings happiness to everybody in every <laughs> bottle and glass, yes, it, um, it's still one of those things that it's, there's a lot of pressure going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, sure. Ship doesn't flow downhill, it flows up right back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Slingshots out and back is what, I, what I'd say. So music for me is, is important as well as working out to get the stress out of that. And uh, luckily I'm good enough to play with a lot of great players in the Bay Area. And even when you brought me out to, to play in New York for Absolute 2, that was a pinnacle highlight of my, of my life, by the way. Wow. And, and phenomenal experience. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for that oh, opportunity. Thank Please you. hire me again. You know? we, we were thrilled to have you there. The guys have really enjoyed it. It was great. <laughs> yeah, they've never heard of a beer brewing uh, yeah. trombone player. That's a real niche, niche item. <laughs> Well, I, the music being able to, uh, to be a semi, you know, semi-pro, I, I guess I'd put it in that category, where I get to take, pay gigs and, and have a blast playing with top players, it's, it's awesome. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to do that, to be both have, have a well-diversified and well-rounded background. Um, 
It makes life a lot of inter much yeah. more interesting. And and I have to say, like you've been, you know, you've been very supportive to musicians. You've you've sponsored all kinds of music festivals, San Jose Jazz Festival, and, yeah. and you've been very generous to me, very extremely generous over the years in helping my bands come out and. And I know that you give a lot to the community, and the musicians here are very grateful for your presence and everything you do. In addition to the beer, of course. You got to <laughs> feed the musicians, you know. That's <laughs> that's part for the course. But it's one of the, the the fun things is that we uh, every time we do a gig, we we get to hang out, and uh, tonight we'll be doing it too. I, ha I have a feeling that yeah, might just happen. That's, that's, yeah. that's all part for the course. Um, now let's shift over. You 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 teach an entrepreneur class at Stanford University. Yeah, I'm a guest lecturer there. So obviously you're seeing the brightest minds uh, in, the, in, the, in the world uh, yeah. on a regular basis. Um, I often think of uh, becoming a musician and starting a freelance career, especially as a, like a tiny version of being an entrepreneur and how you have to approach things. And that it's, I use the example a lot of saying, you know, I'm the Mike Davis trombone store. And, and my, my job as a trombonist is to do these things. And part of customer service is involved. I got to show up, return phone oh, yeah. calls, do all those things. Um, Specifically in terms of starting a new venture and, be, or, and beginning a career in, in music, what advice do you give to young entrepreneurs as well as young musicians? Well, get an engineering degree first and <laughs> foremost. It's going to help you out as a trombone player because you're not going to make it as a bone player. Let's face it. You know, how, how many, there's a handful out there in the U.S. that are going to be able to, to, to get a comfortable lifestyle from just playing trombone. So you better have some other skills to go along with it. Mm -hmm. And then use it if opportunity strikes and you're able to, uh, to turn the, the bone playing into a career, that's a that's bonus. But mm -hmm. have it a balanced approach, two-pronged, where you have at least a solid number of skills along with playing trombone because it ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it. Well, I mean, I think to a degree, that's true. But let's take you, for example. I think you could have made it as a professional trombone player. You wouldn't have this in the lifestyle, and you probably wouldn't be Dan Gordon, worldwide known yeah. person. But could you have made a living and survived and had a life uh, for yourself? I think, I think the answer to that, in my opinion, is yes. But, well, thanks. I appreciate but, that. But on the other hand, you, you obviously had this tremendous drive and intellect and wanted to create something that was far bigger than just playing some bass trombone yeah. parts. Well, I, I think the first thing is everyone should pursue their passion. If you can make a living doing what you love to do, you better make sure that's something you really love to do. Because mm -hmm. you're going to have to be extraordinarily resilient and, and persistent in order to succeed. It's just, I, I feel sorry for all these talented trombone players, you know, hundreds of them out there yeah. that are going to these auditions and, you know, face it, guys that are 45 to 60 are getting the majority of the gigs because it takes that long to get established. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in, in your era, or in when we were growing up, we had the big bands where you could get recruited to, to get your, your chops and, and notoriety out there. And, your, and Stan Kenton was there, Maynard, Buddy. Um, sure. There were a lot. There were at least five touring big bands where, where the top 20, 25 graduates in every instrument from around the country could get a get a road gig. Yeah. And now there's nothing, literally. Right. I mean, there, there's so that pathway isn't there. I, and I, I feel sorry for a lot of the the young superstars that are coming out of the music schools and trying to find out where to go. I mean, they're not going to show up to L.A. or San Francisco and make inroads. You know, especially right. baseball players. You look at it. There's Two guys in every city, maybe, right, that are right. getting it. I guess, in, to a certain degree, it's, it's not dissimilar. We were talking before the interview about how many uh, breweries open up every year. Obviously, a lot of them are just in, in their own garage. It's not, yeah. it's not Gordon Beers. But you're talking about, I think you threw out the number of 400 a year. Yeah. So, you know, in a way, I guess, as it's not dissimilar to a musician in that you somehow have to think outside the box. That's, a, that's yeah. an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. There, there's a similarity there. There's also a difference because you have extraordinarily well-trained and educated musicians coming out. In the brewing side, we got a lot of home brewers, I mean, that are just opening up in their garage. Right. They haven't paid their dues. They haven't uh, you know, spent four years going to USC and studying music or going to Manhattan School or any of the, the institutes where... These kids are coming out and they're top flight players. They may be better than any of us that are, you know, out there, or any trauma players that are, you know, earning a living at it, really. Right. They, they don't yeah. have the connections and no one trusts them because they got pimples and they're 22 years old, you know. <laughs> but the, the truth is, is that these guys that I'm competing with in the brewing sector are wannabes. Mm -hmm. And the ones that, that are coming out in the, from the music uh, education process are solid players. Right. So it's, it's a little, little disappointing in that regards. Yeah. I think. Um, let's talk beer for a second. Oh, hell yeah. So, uh, 
By the way, we've been pounding. A, we had a little camera difficulty earlier. Well, we so had this, to, this uh, is yeah. like uh, round number three. We haven't started slurring yet, though. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Um, well, Gordon Beer's beers are among my favorite beers. I have to say, your Meritzen is still my number among, one. Among is the number one beer. <laughs> I, you should only drink Gordon, Gordon Beer's. Gordon Beer's um, beer like an automobile. <laughs> um, the Never Meritzen, trust a skinny brewer. That's right. Uh, the Meritzen is still my favorite, but this is uh, your new uh, swiggle box. These are the big bottles, yeah. You can't uh, get them everywhere, but uh, if you are lucky enough to be in Northern California, limited release, unfiltered blonde box, and it's called a Bugelfrischluss. Swickle means out of the faucet, so it's like drinking beer that's straight out of the t aging tank. Wow. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, I have, quite frankly, I haven't had a Gordon Beer's beer that I didn't think was spectacular, but the Meritzen has Thank always you. been my favorite, and this is my new number two. If you had to pick some other brands that, that jump out at you that you like, obviously you wouldn't. But if you had to, can you give me five or six? Bad uh, question, Mike. Bad, bad question. <laughs> well, what, what's your next question now? <laughs> follow up? Follow up? We're, I, I'm not going okay. to be able what's, to pay for this filming what, what? Without, without pushing a lot of it. Look, the New York flies are following you. Have they're you noticed they're not coming they, to me at all? They, they called their brothers and sisters. Yeah. And I'm like, he's here. He it's amazing. It's <laughs> incredible. Late, they got here. Absolutely incredible. Right, what's Good. it like having your own? What, well, you and I went to a uh, San Jose Sharks game a couple years back. Yeah. It was so much fun. First of all, there's a whole Gordon Biersch kiosk uh, stand and, and everything. And then they have a whole video of you. Uh, yeah. and, and you're walking around and people are like, Oh, it's kind of oh, well, fun doing that, yeah. It's, but what's it like seeing growing up in the Bay Area, and then now you go to Candlestick Park, and there's Gordon Beersh all over the place, and you go to uh, San Jose it's, Arena. It's, it's weird. I, you, first of all, I cannot afford an ego. That's that's number one. I really don't. I don't get affected by that. It's almost like there's a complete disconnect from marketing person Dan Gordon and the real person. Right. And I, I just it doesn't sink in to tell you the truth. And when I go to sporting events and see that. And if I'm going at a Gordon Beer shit at, a, at an airport someplace, by the way, how would you like to get on a flight with someone for five hours after they've had an order of garlic <laughs> rice? That's quite the ex aromatic flight experience. Yes, yes. Uh, coming out of your pores. Although I, I, clearly I want to sell the, the heck out of them, but right. the, the, the truth is that that's going to be a rough flight. <laughs> but it doesn't sink in. And all I do is worry about the experience, the customer experience. I cannot relax at a sporting event you saw me how panicked I was throughout I the whole time. All you I'm thinking about is shit. Yeah. Are those fries crisp or not? You know, yeah. is the beer being poured with the right amount of head? Are the beer lines clean? You know, this is what's going on in my mind when I'm at, at a sports venue. It's not like I can sit back and relax. I have to go to some atoll in the middle of the Pacific where there's nothing yeah. in order to be able to, uh, to shut off. It seems to me it's very similar to great musicians, whether you're talking about Went Marcellus or Yo-Yo Ma or Dan Gordon. Is it, the attention to detail is there. And, and having eaten at your restaurant so many times, your, every plate of food that comes in, every beer you evaluate, I can see your brain working. It's just I, like, I cannot shut off. But that has to be part of why you've achieved the success you, you've achieved, because the, it's just constant focus. Yeah, really. you have to be focused. And attention to detail, like you said, is extraordinarily important. And I think, you know, Obviously, that uh, carries over to the music side. Showing of up as on well. time is a big deal too in the music world. Indeed, that, that, if you want to have something that gets you gigs, you better be there early. And, and personal hygiene. You talked about Anheuser Busch. I mean, as funny as this sounds, I've actually had uh, situations in New York where people said, ah, "I don't want to use this guy because he kind of smells a little." It body sounds, odors, sounds silly, body odor is uh, a big deal. Well, some of those studios though seem to be set at a 95 degree. Uh, temperature level. Well, indeed, that's another thing. I was thing. drenched when we did Absolute <laughs> 2. <laughs> that room, I think, was 95 degrees and uh, summertime, right? It was a bit, yeah, it was a bit. It uh, was toasty. It was a bit I, warm that day. Yeah. I saw the video and there, there was, he said, oh, you're going to like it. I go, yeah, the cameraman was on me watching just sweat dr dripping from my scalp. Yeah. It was great. Thanks. That, that, was, that was a special session, though, because Stephen Brompen had commissioned the piece and he, yeah, of the Brompen family. And, and so it was just like a really... Uh, it was a very memorable day for me. I'll, I'll never forget that. It was great. Well, he was sitting in the, in the air-conditioned uh, mixing room. That yes, was, of course. Uh, well, he is a Bronfman. He, so, is. he looked good. <laughs> he looked very good. I want to be a Bronfman when I grow up. <laughs> Dan, it's been so great to spend some time with you here today. Thanks so much for, for taking time out and for sponsoring this video and, and, uh, and for making Gordon Beer Spears. I, I like to close out all of our interviews with uh, just asking what advice you would have for a young person. And I would like to frame it in a certain kind of way. Uh, with this one. I know your son Oliver is doing great and he's a chip off the old block, extremely intelligent, bright and hardworking guy and off on his own path. But what would you say if, if Oliver came to you and said, uh, Dad, I want to I start my own brewery? 
Uh, what, what, what piece of advice would you have? I, I would tell them first and foremost, you're going to have to pay your dues and you're going to have to sit here and learn every aspect of operation before you do that. Mm -hmm. You cannot shortcut to success. Mm. That's great. Well, listen, for all of you who uh, are coming back uh, from the East Coast, perhaps, and uh, checking out Gordon Beers, you can find Gordon Beers restaurants all over uh, the country. But don't uh, have to go to those. Just buy a six pack. That's how I make my money. That's it. Yeah, it's all about <laughs> the big uh, models too. About, you know, about, about the brewery and uh, stop by the brewery. Stop by uh, Gordon Beers uh, in downtown San Jose. It's yeah. awesome stuff. We do do tours here too. Email on our website, and you can come check out the bottles going round and round. Our brewers love to do tours at 2 a.m. Wow. We run 24-7, so they never get to see people. I got to say, too, I went to the GordonBeersh.com website before we came out, and a great site, too. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff on that. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar yet, check out Gordon Beersh Beer. If, for those of you who are, keep uh, chugging ahead. And, Dan, thank you so much for uh, hey. your time today. Really appreciate it. Awesome. We'll see you next time on Bone to Pick.